doing in recent years? Right, right. so I'm recently retired, but mm. uh, just before retirement I was working part-time at uh, Dublin City University, mm -hmm. uh, actually in the computer science department, but which has very close links with the translation department, on a project called uh, Centre for Next Generation Loca uh, mm -hmm. Localization. Yeah. And uh, my job there was um, actually as director of um, education and outreach, although I did also do have a research portfolio there. Okay, within the CNGL? Within or? CNGL, yeah. exactly. Um, and l before I talk about research, which is probably more interesting, let me just give a little plug for one of the things I was doing uh, as part of the outreach program. I got involved in something called a Linguistics Olympiad, which is a, a, a science competition for high school students in linguistics. They have to solve linguistics problems. And I actually started up the Irish Olympiad. And I also helped up start a, an Olympiad up in the UK as well. And uh, the, the top scoring kids on this Olympiad, uh, we take four to the International Linguistics Olympiad where they compete against high school students from all over the world. There's mm -hmm. about 35 countries participating okay. at the moment of trying to grow that. So that's a little plug for that, which is very nice because it's kind of going right back to my origins, which is linguistics. Okay, so you're really a linguist who's had an interest in translation? In, indeed. And especially in, in technology? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, tell, I know, I'll tell you about that a little bit later. Yeah. Oh, tell so me about the CNGL. So CNGL is an um, a, a Irish government-funded research project on localization. Uh, it was originally a five-year project and uh, its funding is just coming up for a new or next month, I think. So they're hoping very much that they're going to um, get another few years of doing that. And um, it had a major, uh, it involved four universities in Ireland and several um, uh, companies who were more or less involved, as mm -hmm. is usually the case with mm -hmm. companies. Some, some were actually very, very active and some sleeping partners, really. Um, uh, but it had a very, very um, significant machine translation research component. Uh, you may know that um, DCU already had quite a strong mm. machine translation research group. I would say the strongest in Europe at the moment, actually. Or, well, at that moment. Um, and then this extra funding allowed them to recruit, you know, tens of PhD students, 10 or 15 PhD students. So it was really, really very strong uh, the, the website talks about more than 100 research. Yes, well, so that was spread over four universities, okay. three in Dublin and one in Limerick. Uh, you probably know Limerick as being one of the big centres for localisation. Uh, yes, so, um, but, but they were spread over, there was some speech research, there was some... Um, uh, some research in, at Trinity College in um, uh, various other aspects of uh, quite on the periphery of localization, if I'm honest. Okay. Um, so developing um, kind of interfaces and, and uh, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, but the the research that I did as part of CNGL was furthering the kind of stuff that I was had been doing at the very end of my career in Manchester. Uh, we should mm. mention that most of my But you're not are, Irish. But I'm not Irish. Irish. I didn't even move to Dublin because <laughs> it was my right. time. Okay. Uh, so I was commuting a little bit. And that's part of the reason why I stopped doing it, in fact. But you've been based in Manchester. I was so based in Manchester. I had been based in Manchester pretty much all my career. Yeah. Um, which we'll come to in a minute, I guess. But um, the, the work that I'd latterly been doing in Manchester concerned uh, using translation technology to help people who I call it disadvantaged by language. Uh, so, for example, the, the tail end of my time at uh, Manchester, we did a very interesting project helping Somali asthma patients when they go for a, a review with the asthma nurse. Um, and then in Dublin, uh, I continued that work and we were focusing, rather interestingly, on sign language users. So deaf. Okay. But this, the, with the Somalis, this is using machine translation. Well, it wasn't the 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 actual the research I did at, at the tail end of my Manchester career wasn't actually using machine translation. It was using technology in general. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that work was with very low level technology, just a touchpad with pictures okay. and and um, recorded speech. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of integrating. Any, any technology that was, and, and that was, in fact, my theme became 
Um, it doesn't have to be machine translation, it doesn't have to be speech translation. Almost anything will make life better for both the doctors or, or nurses, whatever it might be, the healthcare practitioners. Okay, so this, this would be an encounter between doctor, patient, pushing buttons on a Yes. Contact, yeah. So the doctor would ask the question, uh, well, the, the, basically the, the, um, what we arranged was, um, basically these interviews are sort of predictable mm. to us, 95% predictable. They have a range of questions to ask, obviously that the, the interview can branch out in different directions depending on what the answers are. Um, but, uh, you know, they have a range of questions that they typically ask. So you set those up on a computer, um, they touch the screen, it speaks it out in Somali, and then a range of answers uh, with pictures, because a lot of the patients we were working with, Somalis were, weren't even literate mm -hmm. because of um, the situation that they'd been brought up in. Um, so it would have pictures, Somali text, Somali recordings of the text, and they'd listen to all the answers and point to the picture. Yeah. And um, really low-level technology. Yeah, you go from the, high, the highest tech yes, to the lowest really, tech. Yes, really, really low-level tech. But and and the um, responses from these these the people who were trying this technology out was it was absolutely marvelous. Um, you know, they got much further in an interview than they ever had before with you yeah. know miming and sign language. So perhaps a lot of what we need is actually quite low tech. Right? I th I more, thought uh, more, the less I the lesson I learned from that was that. Um, this is going to sound so corny and so obvious. You know, make it patient-centered rather than technology-centered. Have a look and see what the situation is. What do they need? Okay, how can we address those needs? Not what have we got? How can we make them use it? Yeah. So, goes a um, lot of I guess the way a lot of academics think. Well, um, that, you know, that's not to say that there's not a place for better technology. Yeah. You know, for speech synthesis, speech understanding. You know, all sorts of MT. Um, but uh, often the simpler solutions are very obvious. I mean, another one which I thought would, would just be so, so, so easy to implement, and I was trying to chase up a company who might be interested in doing this. When you get a prescription, uh, oh, I'm gonna, um, I'll tell you a little story that was told to me which will appeal to um, Spanish speakers watching this interview. Um, so when you get a prescription, uh, you get the instructions in English, in England, obviously, uh, the local language, and quite often the, the people who are taking the, the medication can't understand sufficiently well the instructions that are printed on the, I'm not even talking about the, you know, the indications and the warnings and the, yeah. you know, the leaflets, yeah. Yeah. which, you know, could be translated offline uh, as, as part of, you know, as part of a localization task. But the, um, the instructions, you know, take twice a day after mm -hmm. meals or whatever. Um, and, and there's a very interesting block to this, which is the pharmacist is responsible for interpreting what the doctor has scrawled and making sure it's correctly printed mm -hmm. on, the, on the package. Mm -hmm. So to have that package printed in Chinese or Somali or Urdu or whatever the local minority language is, um, is a big problem for the pharmacist because if it's written in Urdu, they can't confirm, they can't be responsible for mm -hmm. whether it says what they think the doctor meant. And you know, sometimes the doctors write something stupid and the pharmacist gets on the phone and says, do you really want them to take a hundred pills every hour? Yeah. And so on. But the, the nice story from, uh, uh, from America, which was, um, you know, some Spanish speaking patient was uh, um, given uh, a prescription which, and the instructions were to take once a day after a meal and they took 11 on oh, <laughs> uh, And you know, fortunately it wasn't life-threatening, but really, clearly if you're yeah. meant to take once a day and you're yeah. taking 11 a day, that's not very <laughs> Drum, clever. Yeah. So um, anyway, so that was a, just a very, very simple idea, which was, uh, you know, and it's not even machine translation, because you could have all the combinations of the things mm -hmm. that, that are likely to, you know, once a day, twice a day, yeah. after meals, before meals, orally, externally. This, this, so the this, idea this. would be that the doctor gives... The instructions in English, English yeah, and, uh, and from the pharmacist's point of view, they're printed in English, and it could even say, you know, when in doubt, the English is correct, mm -hmm. which doesn't help the patient, but it helps the pharmacist. Yeah, yeah, um, but has it in the foreign language. Yeah. So just those kind of really, really simple ideas. And, you know, they will, they will creep in. Um, I mean, I remember... 
sorry, uh, you know, five, ten years ago, saying, why don't the ATMs give the messages out, in the, especially in tourist areas, why don't the ATMs, when you go and get cash out of them, hold well, they do. Well, well, they do now. Yeah. But, you know, ten years ago, I was saying, why don't they do it in English? Yeah. Uh, sorry, why don't they do it? Why can't you press a button to see which language yeah. you want? And then, you know, one day they did, and I went, whoa. <laughs> I mean, not, nothing, not because of anything I had said. But no, but it's, it's helping just, people. In the, it's in helping the people. Um, can, can we go back to yeah. when you were in your early 20s or so? Right. You're a linguist. How did you get to be a linguist? How did you get into okay. MT? Oh, well, you, well, <laughs> well how I got to be a linguist go goes back, back to how to, you got to be a linguist. Yeah. <laughs> well, that goes back to childhood. So, yeah. um, so my father was a, a, a language a German teacher. Ah. So, and um, actually, all all of the people in my family we've all been interested in languages. So, my brother works as a translator in Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, my other brother worked in the computer industry. So. Um, but I was always interested in linguistics, even before I knew it was called linguistics. Went to university to study linguistics, which, by the way, um, to study just linguistics on its own in the early 70s was quite unusual, which explains how I came to Manchester and how I got into computational linguistics, because uh, having done linguistics, I decided I didn't want to have a real job. I wanted to stay on in academia and decided to apply to do an MA, a master's, and I was recommended to go to Manchester. From you were in Liverpool. I was no, I was at Bangor University, right. okay. uh, which is not very well heard of, but it was okay. It was good. Uh, no one famous went there, but uh, well, they did actually. Before I was there, people played they, okay. but no. Um, uh, yeah, so I ended up in Manchester, wanting to do a postgraduate degree in linguistics, and the first thing I discovered was that in those days. Postgrad linguistics courses were conversion courses because they assumed no one had done linguistics. Mm -hmm. So I was more or less the first person I'd ever come across who'd already done a linguistics degree. And so most of what they were offering I'd already done. Uh, so very quickly they said, well, uh, I don't know what you're going to do. Maybe you could do a, just an MA by research instead. But they did offer a couple of courses which I'd never done before. One was child language acquisition, which hadn't been covered in my first degree, and computational linguistics, which mm -hmm. I'd never heard of. Mm -hmm. And that was taught uh, down the road at UMIST. So in those days, and in fact till quite recently, Manchester had two main universities, UMIST and the University of Manchester. And they were kind of loosely connected right at the top, but they were essentially independent universities. Um, so I found myself going down two, three times a day to learn programming and computational linguistics, uh, which had just been established um, at UMIST under the guidance of a professor called Juan Sega, mm -hmm. who was really well known in terminology and translation mm -hmm. studies, uh, and who had this vision about computer technology. And I have to mention a guy called Rod Johnson, who was my mentor in those days. Uh, but uh, sadly, he left the field um, uh, some years later, and I've kind of lost touch with him. So if you see this Rod on the internet, <laughs> okay. get in touch. Um, anyway, so that was my intro introduction to computational linguistics, and um, at that time, so this is 20, uh, what did you say, 20 years ago, 1977 is when I came to Manchester. So at that time I thought of myself as a phonetician. Ah. So my, my master's thesis was actually about using the computer to help speech therapists analyse speech articulation data. So. Uh, what I did is I devised a method of transcribing um, phonetic transcriptions into a machine-readable form, which wasn't, of, you know, was, wasn't <laughs> had to devise a kind of transcription device in those days, and then um, uh, analysing the results and printing out mm -hmm. the uh, data. Um, so it was much later, or a little bit later, in t when I started my PhD, that I sort of got. Uh, interested in machine translation, which is basically what I spent my whole career mm. doing. Um, and that was really quite a change. I mean, computationally it wasn't a big change, but uh, that was quite a shift from being a phonetician to being mm. uh, a kind of all-round applied linguist. Yeah. Generally. That's interesting. You, you, you did work on, on training people at MT, or the use of MT in training processes. That, that came a little bit later. That um, so, so what was interesting about machine translation 
in the early days was it, re it was really linguists. It really was a linguistic, um, a linguistic computing enterprise. Um, but um, from the very early days, we, um, as a linguist, uh, so a lot of people who got into computational linguistics were computer scientists who found language fascinating, whereas I was linguist trained and kind of learned to be a programmer. Um, but I, I always had this connection through family and, and just interest in translation, which, if you like, is a very traditional application of linguistics. Uh, sorry, not theoretical linguistics, yeah. but... Um, uh, you know, I was, when people said applied linguistics, they meant language teaching. I thought, well, language teaching, why do you teach languages? Well, a lot of people think that they're learning languages to become translators. So I always saw that link with translation studies very closely. And also, as I say, the, within our department at UMIS, there was a strong link to translation mm. studies and terminology. Um, um, so uh, we, I always saw machine translation as, as being that kind of activity. And um, so, from quite early on, I was equally interested, just as much interested in, the, in developing the technology from a kind of computer science point of view as focusing on the, what the end users, mm. whether they be translators as we thought originally, or you know, as eventually turned out, lay users as much as anything. Yeah. Uh, so I've always had that interest in making sure they understood what was going on and, and also addressing their fears. So, so one of the things that we were involved with right from the start, again through Juan Sega, was um, a series of conferences, I'm sure you're familiar with, the ASLIB conferences in Lon held every year in London. And they always had that theme of, of translators and the computer, not computers mm -hmm. for translators. So um, I was always aware, you know, periodically gave an invited talk there or... Um, uh, whatever. Uh, so I was always aware that you know it was very very important to keep or try and get translators on board. And of, of course, in those days, back in the late seventies, when I'm talking, early eighties, translators were massively, massively against any sort of technology, even using word processors. Believe it or not, at the beginning, at the beginning, you had to drag translators to the computer oh. screen and say, "Look how much time this is going to save." Uh, but that series of that series of conferences was always um, uh, showcasing the latest ideas, and not just machine translation. Speak, you know, I remember seeing demonstrations of um, a dictation uh, technology, so that instead of having to type, you could dictate the translation. Mm. And I knew translators who did that. Some of them used secretarial services. Others started experimenting. I think it was called Dragon something or other. Like naturally speaking, and naturally yeah. speaking, and, and Let, let's move on a bit. Yeah, um, I, did, I mean, MT's moved a lot from the seventies. Oh yes, a completely different thing. Has, has the advent of statistics, statistically based, statistically yeah. based MT, sort of moved the linguist out of the field at all? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, yes and no, but mostly yes. So. Um, so what I was going to say to you is that uh, uh, you know all the time I was focusing on machine translation as a technology, it was as a it was as a linguistic right, yes, enterprise, yes. and we thought linguistics was the way to do it. Yes. We thought writing programs in which you could program linguistic rules and dictionary for and language that, pairs for language pairs, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know I invested a lot of my effort and most of my career was was along those lines, and then um, well as you know it was about 1990. Uh, this kind of idea of statistical translation grew up and uh, really took everyone by surprise and everyone was very sceptical about it. But of course, as we now know, it completely took over uh, um, the field to the extent that actually I don't know anyone who does old style linguistic uh, machine translation research. Uh, but what became very evident quite early on is that um, the people who were doing the statistical approach were, were very often ignorant of what had gone before, which mm -hmm. was very, um, you know, that made us cross in a way. Um, and quite often they'd, you know, there was a small period when they, we'd be going to conferences and they'd be saying, oh, we've discovered this problem and here's how we're going to solve it. And it would say, what do you mean you've discovered this problem? Go and read Bernard Vauquois, 1975, or, you know, this, these problems are all well known and well understood mm -hmm. and the solutions are partially or very uh, largely linguistic. These are linguistic problems. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, it was very gratifying a little bit, you know, it took them quite a long time, but, uh, you know, at a certain point, um, it then became the case that they were looking back, not to traditional linguistics or traditional computational linguistics for solutions, but at least they were acknowledging that the problems were linguistic and that somehow they had to find statistical approaches to linguistic problems. So that, for me, was a, was a big turning point in all yeah. that research. And I think that's why it's all so much better. So, for example, instead of just counting words and shuffling words around, they suddenly discovered phrases and that, you know, and you get this thing called phrase-based statistical machine translation, which was a little nod to the kind of stuff we'd been doing for 15, 20 years. And so, not get, but the big shock for me was we really got nowhere. We felt like it was, you know, each conference the linguist, we get, Yeah, really, the linguists yeah. really, you know, for me the big shock was just how quickly they got, the statistical people got systems which were just as good, if not better, than what we were doing, mm. or, or, you know, as good but in different ways, or good at things that we didn't... You know. uh, Andy Way describes some of the tension in those years, describing yeah. scenes at conferences and things. Are we over that now? Oh, uh, well, yeah, because, uh, um, you know, the dinosaurs are dead. Um, Okay. I mean, we, we just sit, into you know, we, well, we right. sit at the back saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we looked at this in the 70s. Oh, and okay. da, da, da. I mean, to be frank with you, I, I, I mean, I've stopped going to machine translation conferences in the last five years because the stuff's kind of whoosh over my head, mm. which was another problem for me as a linguist. Uh, I, it was just a little bit too late in my career to retrain as mm. a statistician. So I was always very interested in that and sympathetic. Um, for reasons I'll, I'll come on to in a second. But what about the shift of focus into to lay translation, volunteer translation, instead of being professional instruments? Uh, MT well, that, have become that was, open. Yeah, well, that was because uh, that was because of the internet, I think. Yeah. So you know, Google Translate, or it's uh, you know, I can't even remember who was who was the first to do that. Um, with statistics based stuff? Well, with any putting MT on the web. Because we used to have babblefish and things like that. Babblefish, that's like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that joke. They go so quickly out of your memory when they, they fade from the forefront, don't they? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so that shift to lay users um, was, I think, because. Uh, Translation was offered for free on the internet, mm. and you know that brings me to the question I know you're going to ask me soon, which is which is where, what research we which we'll go into now. Better go what, forward, but what? but let me just say one yeah. more thing about the um, the the dinosaurs. So uh, you know there is a regret that all that. I mean I don't think that work was in vain because I think we understood as linguists and computational linguists we understood the problems of translation much better. And you know if you ask about my personal career, you know one of the highlights was for a brief time. I was co-author of what became um, a kind of standard textbook yeah. in MT just for a little while, yeah. uh, basically before the, the statistical revolution. And people have still say to me, uh, you know, of course half the book is more or less useless because it's about how to do linguistic rule-based translation, but they, people still say to me that the overview of linguistic problems in translation from a computational point of view, they found that very useful. No, still so still to so people still, still refer to it. Uh, you know, you can rip out the, the last 200 pages, but the first 100 pages, you know, I, I still cling to. Um, okay, so, so coming to more or less to the, the present, so what happened was suddenly you saw machine translation on the internet. Oh, and of course, the other big thing where statistical, what, you know, why we won't go back to linguistic um, days is they very, very quickly um, matched what you could do with rule-based systems for like 20, 30 languages. Yes, yeah, that's it. You're and right. that was for yeah. me, uh, you know, I mean, it was marvellous, but it was also, you know, quite scary. Um, and, you know, just forced people to admit, you know, this is the way you have to it's do it. There's a certain conceptual elegance to it. Uh, um, and, and that tied in very neatly with, uh, you know, my long-term interest also, which we haven't even mentioned at all yet, in minority languages, however you define minority, whatever that means. Uh, you know, I used to joke, Minority languages in England include Urdu, which is, you know, the second most widely spoken language in the world or something. I don't know what it is, but it's a minority language yeah. from yeah. a UK perspective. 
Um, anyway, so how, what, however you define minority languages, it seemed to me that the, the whole statistical corpus-based approach was really, really good news yeah. for um, combating what I always call linguistic imperialism of English, mm -hmm. and to a lesser extent Spanish. Although most translations are to and from English. That's, that's uh, correct. Uh, but which is the base. But, but particularly from English into yes. languages which, uh, you know, there's the famous story 20, 30 years, you know, this famous Billy Brandt story, which is, you know, if we're buying, we buy in English. No, no, sorry, if we're buying, we buy in German. If we're selling, we sell in English. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, when I first came into the field, even in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, it was still the view in America, for example, that if you want to trade with America, you trade in English. Yeah. And, and you know that that you really saw that get turned completely on its head throughout the 80s and 90s. With the kind of world recession wasn't there, and just just the, the big boys had to work harder to sell. Yeah. And you know one of the one of the pills they had to swallow was the linguistic pill, which was good news for us. Yeah. Um, what what let's move on. right. So what, so what research should we be doing? Right. So. Um, well, I'm far better for me to tell other people what research to do. What, what, if, I was still, advice, if I was still more yeah. active in the field, yeah. uh, I think that the, the, um, the lines I would be following, as, as I did in the last few years of my active life, would be the ones I've already mentioned, which is using the technology to help... Um, I, I, I started calling them language disabled, and I was told, told mm, that's not... They won't... That's not a very good term to use, but people who are disadvantaged by okay. their yeah. uh, lack of language. So, so all, th you know, this doctor, patient, and, and all sorts of other, you know, law courts, all sorts of other conditions mm. where um, people who don't speak the majority language are disadvantaged because, because of that. And, you know, there's the perennial argument, well, you know, if you move to a new country, you should learn, to, you know, the integrationist mm. learn. You, know, you should learn English, you should learn Spanish, or whatever it is. And of course, yeah, maybe that's true, but you know, when you're up in a, a, you know, in a tense situation like your health is threatened, or your liberty is threatened, or something's happened that you don't mm -hmm. fully understand, of course you want to recourse to your own language. So, so um, that would be research I would follow. And the thing that I found very frustrating about that, you know, coming back to what I was telling you about the, the research we did with Somalis, they all loved it, they all thought it was fantastic, the, the doctors and nurses that we did it with said, yeah, yeah, yeah. To get that into clinics and surgeries would take 10 years. And Why? Just because, um, first of all, getting it approved and making sure it was safe, that would be a long process. Then just getting doctors and nurses to know about it and try it would be a long process. It just, it was, I just recognise it was very frustrating uh, and also, you know, we were just doing, you know, very narrow case of Somali-speaking asthma patients. What you really needed it for was right across the board for all sorts of languages. So it was just, just the, uh, you know, it was a real lesson in, in the gap that can be between, you know, a nice PhD research project or whatever, and really that having an impact on the real, real world. But other things just kind of shoot into the mainstream really, really quickly. I don't know how it works, really. You know, the availability of translation on the internet, that could have taken years and years and years, but someone, you know, someone took a risk and now everyone right. takes it for granted. And, uh, which brings also, me to the next Also, the, the internet's unregulated. Yes. Part, part of the problem is... Yes. is, is which brings me very nicely yes. to the next thing that I would focus on, more as a, a crusade, if I can use that word, rather than as research, but I'm, I'm very, very concerned that the users of free online translation, be it lay people or translators, don't really understand yeah. what it is. Yeah, and for me, that, would, that was a, a major, uh, you know, even now when you talk to people in bars and they ask me what you do, uh, what, what I did, um, that would be the, you, you know, so it's, it's very nice because it's now very easy to explain what, what do you do. So have you ever used Google Translate? Oh yeah, well, that's what I did for yeah. my whole my career. Yeah. It's a lie really, but you know, it's an easy way to discover. And um, so that would be a major concern of mine is to make people understand what it can, but more importantly, what it can't that do. That means we have to use it in the classroom so people can... 
Steve well, so, so so coming so so for lay people, just to kind of yeah. let lay people understand a bit better what the technology, why translation is hard for a start, mm -hmm. uh, and then what Google Translate can and more importantly can't Absolutely. do. So from a translator's point of view, what you'd expect is that the availability of free online translation would actually create work for them once lay people understand it can do this for you, mm -hmm. but, but it can't do this. Yeah. If you want this done, you take it to a, a proper translator. Now, from a translator's point of view, um, what, what I think is a very interesting development and what they're going to have to learn is that that's one of the technologies that they're going to have to work with and work around. Mm. Uh, we already saw they did sort of embrace uh, translation memories mm. uh, pretty much once, once yeah. they got commonplace. Um, the next thing I think, and, and you know, I'd be interested to know if this is already, I do know that it's already kind of taught in some departments, um, this idea of post-editing machine yeah. translation output. Yeah, we, we translation memories with a machine translation input. Yes. When the memory fails, add your post-editing. Right. So, uh, you know, when that idea first came out, which is 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, there was a very, it was very clear that you had to inform translators that this wasn't reviewing, because, you know, mm. in a proper translation um, workflow, uh, having your translation reviewed by a, a senior person or a di just a different person, you know, most translators understood that that was part of the, mm. the workflow. Um, so, but this isn't reviewing, this is, you, you, this has to be presented as a completely different activity. Yeah, and, and in particular, you, and, you know, you have to train yeah. people to post edit, and in particular, train them to get used to and look out for and understand why you know, the infuriatingly stupid mistakes that translation MT systems make, which is quite different from the infuriating stupid mistakes that, um, you know, a colleague or junior translator makes. So seeing that as a completely different activity, and, you know, the big battle, I suppose, will be uh, persuading translators that that's a rewarding activity, both financially rewarding and intellectually rewarding, okay. which I can see. Uh, I mean, I'd be very interested to know... Um, you know, the extent that translators now, um, you know, accept technology as a, accept that kind of technology as something that they have to work with rather than kind of resisting it, which was always the case. The thing that impresses me in your research and the history of your research, you've moved from very technical things, language and machines, yes. to people. That's, That's depressing. No, impressive. Oh, oh impressive. Impressive. Right. impressive. Yes. yes. And I suspect we need more of that. Yes, yes, I think so, I think so.